This is the DMT One to One Show, episode 25, on the 4th of September 2013, a feature on the company F Sharp, connecting brands and consumers through music. And the DMT One to One Show this week is sponsored by Sheridans at sheridans.co.uk. Welcome to the DMT One to One Show, and this week the show is dedicated to the company F Sharp. And joining me today are Dan Merritt, the CEO and co-founder, and Pete Jimison, a COO and the co-founder as well. So, hi guys, and great to have you on the show. How's it going today? Good. It's great. Great to be here. Thanks great to have you on and a very nice uh, graffiti in the background as I uh, commented in the prep. Uh, it's uh, great to have you on and uh, first of all, what is F-Sharp? Uh, F-Sharp is the leader in digital music advertising. So we integrate um, streaming, rewarding music content into multi-screen branded experiences. So yep. consumers um, can engage wherever they are and brands get um, the consumers to uh, consume music the way that they want to and really act as the envelope in delivering content that they know that they'll love and that's personalized to that individual user. Yeah, and music, of course, is at the core of the company. So what spurred you to start F-Sharp and what was the, you know, the, uh, the, the gap in the market that you spotted when you started the company? Yeah, so when we started the company about a year and a half ago, um, it's really when uh, Spotify and other uh, social music platforms were really starting to, to take hold. Uh, within the U.S. Um, and the larger markets in the world. And what we were seeing is that uh, music platforms were really spending a lot of time on growing their audience, but yeah. not necessarily working on how to actually monetize their audience through branded experiences that were actually incredibly engaging. So the market opportunity that we saw is that there is a significant need for um, incredibly engaging experiences to help platforms like Spotify uh, monetize um, using large brands um, and so what we did is you know, really went after that uh, particular place within the market to really make sure that the ecosystem that was being created within the social music space um, actually had a monetization vehicle outside of you know, boring banner ads that um, have low engagement rates. Of course, and Peter, you started out. The com- uh, you know, the company started out in the midst of a big bubble in New York as well of of startups uh, working working in media and tech uh, and uh, cr- the crossover of the two. So, how how did you find that experience? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's been quite actually riveting. I mean, we have we're we're actually based in Silicon Alley, right off of on Broadway. Yeah, and, and uh, I would say we're we're seeing just companies pop up left and right. And in the last year, I would say, you know, with meetups and, and such, you're seeing probably, you know, an additional one or two meetups just based around digital music um, in, in New York. That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. And so you work closely with Spotify, uh, and this has given you a great uh, amount of perspective on what works and what doesn't work uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the fans, uh, and music fans, of course, and users of the platform. And uh, on top of that, you've, uh, of course, uh, over the course of, of, of the company's work, uh, you develop different types of uh, ads that you serve, uh, uh, depending on the company, on, on, on what they're advertising and, and who they're targeting as well. So uh, can you talk us through a little bit, uh, maybe two or three of the most uh, engaging or popular options that you're serving at the moment as far as ads are concerned? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the fundamental recipe of success that we found is that users want content that they love. And what we've found works the best is showing uh, consumers um, music content that they are familiar with and that they're curious about. And uh, what we've developed um, in that is about five or six um, standard ad solutions that seem to deliver the best results uh, consistently. So one of uh, the recent campaigns that has done extremely well uh, within Ireland is a campaign for Absolute. And Absolute came to us uh, with a, a desire to engage um, around a particular um, type of playlist for different types of uh, experience or different types of social experiences, if you will. So uh, we launched um, an auto-generated playlist is the, the name of the type of product with Ireland and Absolute, um, and that allowed users to um, get a very personalized generated playlist based on uh, their music tastes and really the, the guidance of the brand. Um, and what that does for the brand is it creates um, an everlasting playlist that's branded Absolute and a playlist that consumers uh, can listen to, whether they're at a party or um, having a, you know, a dinner party or whatever uh, within those uh, types of experiences. So Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Uh, and on that front, any other uh, you know types of ads that you want to uh, talk us through? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we've also found is um, by partnering with other people within uh, the digital music ecosystem, uh, like Sounddrop, that we're able to put pretty compelling uh, branded experiences with uh, very high user engagement. So uh, One Direction, uh, a, a UK pop band favorite, um, <laughs> is launching uh, their movie uh, this week, actually. I think it comes out on yeah. uh, tomorrow. And uh, what we did uh, with One Direction is uh, helped uh, generate buzz leading up to the actual Sound Drop Room experience. Um, where uh, people could analyze their favorite playlist and see what One Direction star they were. And yeah. uh, that, within the population of you know, 13 to 21 year olds, uh, does extremely well to see uh, which One Direction star you are. And that basically led up um, a lot of buzz into uh, the actual uh, listening room session uh, that happened on Sunday before uh, the VMAs uh, here. and. Uh, generated a lot of uh, users, lots of engagement, lots of chatter, and it was really fun to watch uh, people vote up different songs uh, that uh, the One Direction movie had put together for that playlist. So, yeah, yeah Andre, on, on top of that, a lot of things that we do here at F Sharp would partner with other music um, providers of, of data, etc. Yeah. So, people like Rovi, um, uh, in this case, it was Sounddrop that it, it offered that uh, in room experience. Uh, for the chatting with One Direction and their fans, um, but others like Mood Agent and yeah. um, Echo Nest um, to enhance the experiences that we're, we're offering for these brand advertisers. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's uh, that's great because uh, of course uh, that's that's the missing link to be able to uh, create an engaging advert that is also personalized and, and makes sense to the end user. And uh, and talking about personalization and, and demographics, so. Uh, I was wondering what is it, your approach on, on Spotify and other platforms as well as far as demographic targeting is concerned and uh, how does that affect, uh, of course, the, the accounts that you take on? Do you only work with uh, big major brands or are you happy to work with a, a localized partner that might be interested in advertising in a specific part of the United States or um, that might have a smaller budget, for example? Yeah, I mean, we work with uh, different brands all over the world. so. Yeah. Two of the biggest growth areas that we have are across Europe as well as into Asia. So um, obviously the largest ad budgets in the world come out of North America, but yeah. <laughs> um, we have as solutions and ad products that um, do incredibly well um, in very you know, localized markets. So yeah. even if it's you know, a very Dutch um, oriented experience that's just launched in Holland, for example, um, we've done a number of those uh, types of campaigns. And as we look into uh, Singapore and Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong, for example, uh, there's a lot of you know, really localized specific uh, types of experiences uh, that allow brands of really any size and any ad budget to create a pretty compelling experience that uh, drives that engagement. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And so, uh, in in that sense, you work uh, quite closely with, uh, I guess, on the Spotify front, who are still one of your biggest clients, uh, uh, with their advertising team, who of course are are engaged in conversation with uh, with ad buyers all over the country, right? Yeah, we work with a, a number of uh, partners, including Spotify worldwide, yeah. uh, to bring music. And what we found is that really. The, the overall music ecosystem needs a number of ways to monetize in order to support itself. Um, so we look at really how do we bring uh, the brands and the music services together in order to deliver the most value in sustaining uh, the ecosystem and experiences. Yeah, and that's very interesting actually because we're talking on the show, on the news show, uh, about uh, the rumors surrounding, you know, um, uh, iTunes Radio and their uh, potentially corporate, you know, advertising uh, buyers that that um, you know we've seen in the press in the last few days, and, uh, and it's interesting to to see a company that is working in music that is actually creating uh, personalized, engaging experiences on large corporate brands that otherwise have uh, quite a bit of dif difficulty relating to the end user of of, of a campaign. So, so have you found that that's sort of the, the driving force behind the success of F Sharp as well. Absolutely. And I think what, we're, what we look at is um, you know, sort of the iRadio and all of the larger players coming into uh, the streaming music space in new and interesting ways is really uh, lifting all boats, if you will, and really helping um, brands worldwide realize that there's an opportunity to really create 
um, a focus or a pillar of their branding strategy using music. And we're finding that to be um, instead of just, you know, an afterthought or, you know, a single type of experience, they're really figuring out how do I make music core and central to engaging that emotional passion point with that consumer that drives brand awareness, that drives uh, consumer intent in pretty interesting ways. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're playing around the space of where uh, users right now currently are already in music, sharing, discovering. Uh, we're just, you know, we're, we're exploring exactly the same elements that, they're, that you see with users on Facebook or with other digital music providers. Um, <clears throat> and we're just taking that and wrapping a brand around that experience for um, you know, advertisers. Yeah, and, and you've worked a lot with the creative industries as well. So uh, how does the, the, the difference between the engagement of users in a, in a, a cultural product uh, like an album release or a movie release uh, differ from the engagement of users in a, in a vodka brand or in a, in a water brand, for example? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, one of the one of my favorite campaigns was for a movie called uh, Pitch Perfect in the United States, but was branded as Hit Girls in most of Europe. And uh, what we find is in those types of experiences that are localized, uh, that you the, the core concept works incredibly well internationally, yeah. but it's really the localization that ultimately drives the success of that uh, particular um, engagement in that particular experience. And um, even if you have a large, you know, international brand like some of the large fast food restaurants, what you find is that um, they have very localized um, experiences and product launches and things like that. So yeah. it's about making sure that you have the flexibility to quickly localize and adapt um, to that particular market in order to make sure that you don't lose the cultural nuance that will ultimately drive engagement and success. That's and awesome. We try to find ways to play with the brand's messaging as well. So, for instance, with Gold's Gym in the U.S., we did a, a tournament-style um, competition um, that was based off the NCA March Madness uh, in the U.S., and it, it had different brackets that were associated with music, um, such as tempo or beat, et cetera, um, that users could then um, offer a song and then engage and, and share with their friends and vote songs through to, to finally find what's the most engaging song right now that is matched to working out and music. Yeah, yeah. And uh, looking at uh, going cross-platform, of course, because uh, uh, as you mentioned, you know, Spotify is only one of your of your clients right now, um, uh, and you're uh, expanding into catering for more and more platforms. But um, I guess a key question would be, uh, because you're focused on music, uh, how do you manage to still deliver a musical or music-related experience uh, within uh, maybe third-party portals that don't have the same amount of integration with uh, uh, you know, the ability of playing a playlist, for example, as a Spotify has directly? Yeah, so we look at most of our experiences being multi-screen um, from origin, and yeah. we build adaptive and responsive experiences uh, for that. And uh, even if we have a a Spotify-led experience, um, oftentimes those will require a microsite, a mobile experience, as well as a Facebook experience. Yeah. Um, and uh, what we find is that um, increasingly uh, the, the user engagement of actually having a music-driven experience, of getting someone to that first level of engagement, whether that results in a playlist or radio or uh, what have you, um, it can all be managed into whatever that best form factor is and where that user is best going to engage. And I think that adaptive approach is what ultimately drives um, success for the engagement based on that platform and will ultimately show better uh, return on ad spend for that brand advertiser. That's great. And uh, let's talk mobile. Uh, just to conclude the interview, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, Mobile, of course, is a huge area of growth. We've seen Pandora's Q2 show the 92% increase uh, year over year for the same quarter on mobile advertising revenues, which is uh, pretty awesome. But still, the mobile advertising experience is pretty sucky. Uh, on the whole, you know, there's not a huge amount of engagement, and uh, and you know, you're served adverts in a pretty flat manner. You know, we all we've all seen the adverts on Facebook and uh, and the promoted tweets on Twitter. So, do, do you have any any thoughts on how that experience could be improved? Uh, by interacting with music on a mobile level? Yeah, I mean, basically what we look at in the mobile space is really driving that forward is that 
um, any any major urban area in most of the places um, that you go, you see people walking around with headphones and a mobile phone and things like that. So um, really the gateway into successful advertising on the mobile space is really engaging um, audio experiences that drive people into an interactive experience. So. Um, there are you know, types of awareness that can be built into a lot of these mobile products that know where you are and what you're near and whether they serve a relevant audio ad um, within that that drives you into that next part of that experience. Um, I think that's the first part of the, the dynamic nature that's incredibly important. And then the second part is um, can the user actually get a rewarding experience out of interacting with uh, that mobile um, ad uh, from there. And, uh, what we're seeing is really a push into how do you uh, create um, that next listening experience or that music discovery experience that's yeah. aided by the brand within the mobile that's driven through uh, the audio component. And I think what we'll see over the next um, two or three quarters is uh, a big you know, push into how do you create both a sort of a lean back and lean forward experience within that mobile um, ad unit that's going to drive a lot more engagement that's interesting for the consumer and just not an errant click here and there that's uh, creating these artificially high um, CTRs on those things. That's great. That's awesome. Well, uh, you know, the website is uh, efsharp.com and I'm going to throw a few links uh, uh, in the show notes as well uh, to uh, show people uh, the type of work that you've been doing uh, over the past few months. Uh, and uh, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show and really look forward to seeing what you guys are going to be up to next. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. And now a quick word with the media law firm Sheridan's, who sponsored this episode of the DMT One to One. I'm here with uh, Tahir Bashir from uh, Sheridan's, and this week we're going to talk about 360 deals. And so, uh, what are 360 deals all about, and how do they work today? So, uh, we I think we did the first 360 degree deal, or the first one that was really publicised, the Robbie Williams one. Um, they are essentially a record company now says that uh, there's not enough money in just recorded uh, income uh, revenue so they would want a share of merchandise income live income in some instances uh, publishing income and in some instances management income as well so uh, the 360 degree deal is basically income from an artist's career or all, all 360 all around, yeah. you know, whatever they're doing. Yeah. yeah. And so what are the general ranges that artists should expect? Because, uh, of course, uh, I'm sure that the cuts are going to vary a lot depending on pop the popularity of the artist and where they are in their careers too. Yeah, I mean, there's no one size fits all, to be honest, and it depends very much, as you say, where the artist is in their career. So if you've got an established artist, you know, we generally try not to do 360 degrees deals at all. Um, but newer artists, they've got to expect, if they're going to major label, uh, as opposed to independent, that uh, there is a, a, a expectation that, say for example with merchandise, somewhere between 10-15% of merchandise income is going to be set aside for the label. Uh, similarly with live income, that could be, you know, once again 20 to even up to 40% yeah. of that income. Uh, from my perspective, as a lawyer representing artists, the main thing there is, does the label justify that income? What yeah. do they do right. for it? Sure. And uh, looking at the 360 deal uh, model, it was uh, very hyped, uh, maybe like two or three years ago, especially when the Robert William deal came out. Uh, but what has ha happened since then, and uh, is it still as widely used as, as people think? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it all comes down to income levels. Income yeah. levels have dropped in, in recorded sales, as we all know. So uh, record companies invest you know and they need to justify that investment so to justify that investment they need to get shares of other income so that's the perceived uh, perception uh, it's becoming common now um, as i say in particular major labels uh, so it's something that you know artists have to look at you know uh, from from day one uh, as i said then you'd expect some investment back yeah. to reflect that. The types of deals which you know I hate are those where uh, a label's putting in very minimal investment and expect a share of everything. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the DMT One to One show and remember to check out digitalmusictrends.com for our weekly news show.